So good morning or good afternoon if you happen to be watching us at this time. Uh, welcome to today's we wellness webinar, which is hosted by the First Nations Health Directors Association. I would like to acknowledge the many traditional territories on which we are collectively gathered today. My name is Vanessa Charlong. I am the health director for my home community here at the Hupetchesit First Nations in Port Alberni. I became an FNHDA member in September of 2012 and have served on the board since 2014 as one of the three regional representatives on Vancouver Island, representing the new Chandra's family here. So today we welcome Mo Korczynski from Unlocking the Gates Service Society, UTG. Unlocking the Gates Service Society is a peer-led nonprofit organization that supports the reintegration of individuals who are being released from correctional facilities in British Columbia. They connect with individuals prior to their release and provide peer support during the transition from prison back into the community. Mo is being supported by Elder Doreen Peter, who will open and close today's meeting in a good way. So I'll turn it over to Doreen. I need this good morning and thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and I really thank you each and every one of you for allowing me to be here. I am only here for a short time this morning and then I have other obligations that I that I am already booked for but I all, I really want to say how much I appreciate unlocking the gates when I heard about it I really didn't know what it was all about and and I've had meetings with Corina and a couple of meetings with Mo. And I think that it's it's so valuable that each community be involved with this. Unfortunately, in my community, they had a release a, a few months ago and, and, and it, it didn't go over very well. And he was, he was gone within a month after his release. And I think if we had these kind of resources in this community, I think I think there would have been a way for him to move forward after he finished with that part of his life and tried to move on into the rest of this of his life. So, you know, I I'm grateful for each and every one of you, the work that you all do. So today I want to ask the Almighty Creator to, to send a blessing to each and every one of you, to each and every one of all of the, the participants that are near and far. And, and I always ask the I always give thanks to the Creator for each and every day that we get to to open our eyes to yet another day and realize how fortunate that we are when that happens with each and every one of us. And Whatever the day brings for each and every one of us, I always ask the Creator for some peace and some guidance to to help us with all the daily activities that each and every one of us may be in different different places, but all doing the same thing to working together to help all of our communities. And for this, I ask the Creator to give us that strength and that courage that we sorely need to to move forward with each and every day. And I always ask the Creator to help all of our less fortunate people to, to shine his light down upon them and, and to give them some guidance that they may find a, a good path that they may walk. And to the people who are in the hospital who have their own struggles and challenges. And I always ask him for that strength and that courage that they really, really need to, to find their wellness journey again. And then today, I today for this purpose, I especially ask the Almighty Creator to help us with our own strengths and our own courages as we move forward with this meeting to, to send us that peace and that serenity to be able to open up our minds and to be able to share with one another and to be able to walk away with this meeting with some some sense of, of, of victory and knowledge and wisdom to move forward and help each and every one of the community members. This is what I ask of the Almighty Creator. So, Haichka. 
Okay. Thank you, Doreen, and I will turn the floor over to Mo. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll figure it out. There we go. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, and thank you for the beautiful opening, Elder. Um, first, I just want to let you know I'm calling in from the unceded territory of Quatlam and Katesy, um, unceded territory where I get to live, work, and play in Maple Ridge. Um, and just wanted to say thank you for uh, being. We have definitely expanded in the last couple of years since COVID hit. And yeah, I haven't been able to give First Nations Health Authority an update. So I'm very honored and very excited. We've definitely uh, have done a lot of changes. Um, in there. So first, I just want to say First Nations Health Authority has been a huge supporter of UTG since we started uh, 12 years ago. Um, First Nations Health Authority was our only funder for the longest time until actually last year. Um, so we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for First Nations Health Authority. Um, and just ironic that we're doing this presentation today. We actually started Unlocking the Gates um, because of um, the women who are the most vulnerable being released from um, Maple Ridge Alouette Correctional Center, where I'm not sure everybody knows that all women from BC come down to Maple Ridge and then they're released back to their home community and they have to find their own way back. Um, and as today we're you know, marching for so many missing and murdered Indigenous women. This is one of the reasons why we started this program. You know, I also have lived experience of incarceration. And, you know, as we were, as I was in jail, we started noticing all the women going missing. And, you know, um, before probably most people did, um, you know, especially with Picton, the, you know, the Picton farm. And um, so, yeah, so. Um, yeah, so for the longest time, we uh, for the first 11 years, we only worked with women. Um, the last three years, we have now expanded into the men. Um, not saying that, you know, we're very open with open arms. As we said, we're all peers. Everybody has lived experience of incarceration and addiction to work on our team. Uh, and we really believe that no one really understands how hard it is to walk out of those gates and back into to try to change your life, um, except for somebody who's been there and done that. Um, so at the beginning, we wouldn't get support, so we'd go to the court registry and we would write hundreds and hundreds of letters inside corrections for people to get to know who our program was. Um, slowly over time and um, persistence that we weren't going anywhere, um, you know, we started now, you know, started getting referrals from corrections and now we're definitely uh, um, one of their top resources for corrections. Um, so, yeah, let me go here. Um, this is just a little bit about who we are. Um, I love graphic art. I'm not one to vote, you know, PowerPoints and stats, but um, um, you know, this really speaks highly of who we are, you know, building respectful relationships. What really starts with um, that first phone call when people reach out to us who are incarcerated. Um, we hear it time after time. Our phone number is free in all the correctional centers. Um, and our phone's on, as long as the phones are open inside the correctional center, our phone is on. So our phone is on from eight o'clock to 10 p.m., seven days a week. Um, so if somebody's locked up and they can't get out after till after six, what we see a lot of times, especially with COVID, um, there's somebody there to answer their phone. Um, and that's where the relationship starts. You know, people just phone if they're having a bad day or they just want to talk. Um, again, I'm not sure people realize it's like over $2 to make one phone call inside corrections. Um, you know, that's over a day's wage if you happen to have a job. Most people have no money. So being able to have somebody to reach out to and talk about, you know, the struggles and, you know, tell you it's the hardest thing you'll ever do is leaving that life behind and reintegrating back into society where you feel judged um alone sorry <laughs> it's your bike photo off uh, it's crazy busy these days um we have a girl that's missing right now um so 
Um, yeah. And we, you know, and we meet everybody where they're at. Not everybody wants to go to treatment. Not everybody wants to change their life. And um, so, and we don't judge, you know, we just want to make sure people are somewhere safe. Um, you know, it's definitely changed a lot since we started the program. Um, you know, with this overdose crisis, you know, our biggest, one of our top priorities is making sure people are getting from point A to point B, B alive. We know the highest overdose rate are the first two weeks being out of being out, released from corrections. Um, so that's where, um, you know, our team has expanded. Um, we're now in 18 staff around the province. Every, every place they have, um, hold on one second. Yes, I'm on Zoom. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Forget where I was now. Or was I Perrine? Sorry. We're just talking about um, the different locations and your. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'll give you an example. I have two in Kelowna, one in Kamloops, one in Merritt, two in Prince George. I have one in Nanaimo, um, one getting hired in Victoria, um, two in Surrey, two in Maple Ridge and um, Vancouver and the Valley. Yeah. So. And we stay really busy. Um, sometimes my staff go back to the car into each, sometimes to centers three times throughout the day. Um, so right now we're at, um, for the first nine months, we've done 1,100, we picked up 1,100 clients from the um, from professional centers across the province. Um, so super proud. We're probably gonna almost make the 1,500 mark this year. Um, so almost doubled our last year, we did 800 clients. So, yeah. So this is a poster which is actually on all the units and around the correctional centers. So um, besides staff promoting us, they also have these laminated on the walls by the phone so people can't write on them. Um, so this is how people again also get to know about our program. Um, but again, lots of uh, correction officers, release planning, um, you know, they'll phone us up saying, hey, we have somebody who just got released, needs to get to the ferry, can you help us out? We'll be there in 20 minutes. Very seldom we say, no, we can't. Um, so we do a lot of last minute pickups. Um, we do a lot with the courts right now. Lawyers reach out to us, Crown reaches out to us. What's really neat that we're all, you know, ex-cons and, you know, we have this amazing relationship. Um, a lot of people wouldn't be getting released on bail if it wasn't for our letter support and us supporting them in the community um, and also finding them some place to go. Um, you know, we house a lot of people. We do a lot of the release planning. Um, I think right now we probably have about 45 people sitting inside waiting right now for a bed to come available so they can get released. What's super sad that, you know, when people do want to change that there's nowhere for them to go, right? A lot of treatment centers don't accept, accept people directly from incarceration. They want them on the street for 30 days. Um, where are they supposed to go? We don't have any safe housing. I don't classify a shelter safe for someone who just came out of jail, right? They're not going to stay, you know, they might stay clean the first day, but I guarantee you as soon as people know you got out of, out of jail, they're going to be, hey, let's go celebrate um, and definitely put them at a higher risk of OD ODing and dying. Yeah. Yeah. And this is another one, just, we know we probably, there is a way out. And I think that's one of the biggest thing what we offer people on the day out is we give people dignity, we offer hope and let, and then, and there is a way out, you know, you know, every, all of us are being incarcerated, you know, we all now have, you know, changed our lives around and it also, you know, so it gives people hope and we show them that there's a way out. Yeah. So this is another program, this is new, and I'm super excited to um, finally get to share this, um, this program. So when COVID hit and they did the mass releasing in, um, to your mass releasing in May or March, um, and the world shut down, of course, we mass released everybody out of corrections with no buses, no airports, no nothing, all the shelters were closed, all the treatment centers were closed, and we mass release um, inmates or individuals out of corrections. Um, so we started finding out that people were be, you know, breaching pro um, probation because you had to have a phone to be able to check in with your probation officer because they weren't seeing people in person. We know most people who are getting released don't have a phone. Um, so we started the probation bail resolution program where we work with um, probation officers, where we get a release of information signed with our clients. So if they miss their appointment, the bail, 
supervisor calls us up and say, hey, can you go find John? He hasn't signed in. I don't want to breach him. He's got two days to sign in. Being super successful, um, so, so far we've done 243 clients. We actually have 243 clients um, because it's not like a two-day thing. It's, we follow people. If they have a, a year probation order, we, we stay with them for that year probation order. Um, we also, i um, not sure people know, the highest recidivism rate for people are is because they breach your conditions. They fail to sign in at probation. Um, they go into the red zones or they don't follow through with them. So we make sure people get to, if they're court ordered to courses, we make sure they get to their courses. Um, yeah, so super successful. Probation officers love us because, um, you know, they're not, you know, doing all that paperwork, have to breach people. And it actually builds a really good relationship with the client and their probation officer um, because they're not looked at as the bad people. Like they don't want to breach you. They just want to make sure you get through. So super excited. And that program is now in Prince George, Merritt, Kelowna, Kamloops, and Nanaimo and the mainland here. Okay. And then our warrant resolution program. Um, not sure most people know. If you have a warrant, you're not allowed income assistance. You, you know, you don't want to go to a shelter. So people who have a warrant are farther at more risk of hiding farther in the shadows and put them at a higher risk of overdosing. So we actually have warrants. So we have um, lawyers on speed dial. We get we have legal aid approved instantly. We have lawyers who don't wait for the paperwork. They know we're gonna get the paperwork in. We work with Crown, so we know beforehand we take somebody into court that are they gonna get time or are they just gonna get released? We've only had three clients um, actually be arrested and they all knew they were gonna be arrested before they actually went to the courthouse. Um, so now in a couple of the courthouses, they don't even arrest them when they they go to the courthouse. They actually get to sit in the courthouse with our staff. And because they know we brought them in, they're not going to take off. So even sheriffs love it because they don't have to arrest you all that paperwork. Um, super successful. To me, this is another way. And then, we, of course, we support them in the community. Um, and we find now after supporting people for, you know, four or five, six months that they actually want to change and housing. And, you know, today I think we're putting um, five people, five people moving them into housing today, uh, what are from our warrant and uh, bail resolution program. So, um, you know, people just need that support and need people to believe in them. And I think these two programs, because the, our jail program um, is a, usually a three-day program, it never does three days because once they're after the three days and they're on probation, then we roll them into the probation warrant program so that we can now work with people as long as they need us. Yeah. And it's another one. Um, I love graphic art. This was uh, uh, a lady who did it when we did uh, with all my staff and um, what they think and it builds trust. Everyone gets their own place, pay, goes by their own pace, have patience, be flexible. And definitely through staff um, is being peers. It's they're not. It's, this can be challenging. Um, not the easiest population to work with. Um, but my staff do an amazing job. Right? Yeah. And this is our poster. What I'm super excited about. It was never politically correct, <laughs> but it definitely speaks volumes to people who you know. We all know the wanted poster, um, and there's usually a picture of somebody's face. So this is our warrant poster. What we have around communities. Um, in probation officers. Um, we work really closely with income assistance as well because if somebody can't pick up their check because they have the warrant, um, they actually call us and say, hey, can you clear it? help us clear this person's warrant up so they can get their check? We take them to courthouse, then we go back to income assistance. They actually get their check, right? It's not like saying, oh, you're out of luck. Um, so, so many benefits of the probation and warrant. In, you know, we put so many barriers in front of people who are trying to change their life or even just trying to live. I mean, I think we keep punishing people over and over. I think probation is one of the um, biggest downfall of our justice system. We know um, from a research study what doing time, or uh, called doing time, it was a three-year research study we did in 2005, six, and seven. Um, the majority of people were being reincarcerated because of breaches, right? So, and then, and then it goes again, you know, being available when you need to feed them. Um, I won't tell you how many times my phone call, phone rang off last night um, <laughs> at two, three o'clock in the morning. Um, but most of my staff are all there and being non judgmental. And again, building connections inside through in community. We can't do this work without the community. 
right? We're only as good as our community partners. Like our programs wouldn't work if we didn't have, you know, corrections, you know, refer, you know, working with us to make sure people have a safe plan when they get released. Um, the probation and bail program would work if it wasn't for the community. Um, when we started this, Pacific, and we don't do outreach, we specifically look at the justice part of it. Um, we connect people to outreach workers, but outreach workers or their housing outreach workers or mental health outreach workers or addiction outreach workers, they don't deal with the justice part. They don't want to deal with it. So that's where other organizations like outreach workers say, I have, you know, shelters, shelters call us. You know, we have somebody here who has a warrant, you know, hey, can you help them? So the more people know about it, the more, you know, I always say it takes a community to raise a child. It takes a community to support somebody who is, wants to change their life or, you know, the most vulnerable population. So, yeah, this is our bail resolution program. Um, our po poster, a little different, um, but yeah. And this one is your PO looking for you. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> And it's just another uh, one just really talks about who we are, you know, building respectful relationships. Um, you know, for me, with my personal experience, I never had anybody who believed in me. You know, my parents didn't believe in me. No one believed in me. I had one person who believed in me. You know, 17 years later, I'm sitting here as, you know, as an executive director, you know, started a nonprofit, um, you know, two years ago. Um, for the first 13 years, years we were at... Um, UBC at Flower Center for Prison Health and Education. We're sort of connected to research. My boss decided to retire and then we turned our, so we went and became a nonprofit in 2020, right? So huge change for us because now we actually can have access to grants and writing grants. So that's how we do the probation one. We got a grant through um, PHSA. Um, we have um, a reaching home grant where we're supporting people in housing. Um, What's interesting is it's only supposed to house 35 a year. I've actually housed 162 people in the first five months of the grant. So we do a lot of housing and a lot of supporting. We have a great relationship with um, so many great organizations um, to get people into housing. Um, and the one thing about the bail and resolution program where we get to work with people longer is we actually get to um, connect people to more services. You know, when we're connecting people from jail, they're in star, um, survival mode. All they care about is food, clothing, shelter. People come out with no shoes, no jacket, you know, clear plastic bag with their stuff, a bus to get back to their, their community, no place to go, don't know where they're going to get, you know, no money, no food. Um, it's really hard to connect people to other resources when they're in that survival mode. Um, but through the probation and bail program, we actually get to connect people, you know, back to, you know, resources, you know, elders, um, you know, um, for, you know, First Nations, um, medicine and stuff like that, because when it's we offer it the first time, they're like, no, I'll just lose it. Um, so it's been interesting to be able to change and support people more than just that survival mode. Yeah. And this is actually, um, this one too is I really particular on your hiring peers, right? To really work, um, have support for your staff who are peers. Um, they're not the easiest. Um, like I said, we hired people, they have to have prison experience, incarceration, you don't have to have computer skills, you don't have to have any of that. So um, it's, um, yeah, so we have to mentor our staff as well. Um, and yeah, and be non-judgmental and, you know, so I think that's all I have. Um, I don't think I have any other thing to say. Um, I know it was pretty quick. <laughs> um, we do break down in regions as well. Um, we send that to First Nations Health Authority every three months, our stats, and we do break them down into the five um, five health regions as well. Where um, also up in Prince George is really unique too. Um, Prince George, we actually do. We had a grant for about a year um, where we got people back to the remote communities. Um, super successful. I think we took about 100, 100 people back to the remote community. Sometimes my staff drive 12, 14 hours one way, like we take them wherever. Um, so when we lost that funding, I'm actually grateful that um, that my board has approved us to continue it. So we still drive people back. And it's interesting, Prince, up in Prince George, people want to go back to their home community um, compared to down here. Down here, people aren't going back to family. They're not going back to their kids. They're not going um, back. But up, in, up north, um, 
I'd say about 80% of people want to go back to their home community. Um, and if it wasn't for UTG, most people end up getting stuck in Prince George because there's no bus service. You know, sometimes there's only a bus at least once, once a week. And if they get released and they're there for four or five days and it's minus 50, there's no shelter, there's nowhere for them to go. If they reoffend, next time they only get released back to Prince George and then they have to find their own way back. His corrections will not send you back to another community except for the place you were arrested. Mm -hmm. Oh, apparently somebody's trying to get in. I let somebody in, I don't know who. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody has any questions. So Clarissa, welcome. I am so sorry. Um, uh, we just wrapped up the session, but I don't know if you've heard of Unlocking the Gates Society. Um, Mo is the director and um, she just gave an excellent webinar. We are recording it and hope to have her back. But if you have any questions, um, she is a great contact. Um, if you want to ask her anything now, I know like you literally came in right at the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. So I apologize. But yeah, I'll open the floor um, and just have, you know, a, a, a good discussion if you wanted to do that, Clarissa. Mm -hmm. I have one more thing to say. We also um, connected, partnered up with um, the BC Disease Center where we handed out 200 cell phones to individuals who were being released who had um, undiagnosed uh, hepatitis C. Um, so they had the phones for they get six months on a plan and then after six months they got to keep their cell phone. Super successful, um, people completing hepatitis C. Um, what was amazing, um, we just launched on Friday another cell phone program where we're interviewing people um, the day they get released at one, 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 one month mark and two month mark where they get paid $80 for their interview. They get a cell phone and they get to keep the, the smartphone afterwards. We're asking them about, you know, lack of, you know, treatment. Actually, we're asking everything. It's going to be amazing data um, what's coming out. And we've partnered with BC Disease on Center and UBC on that as well. So we actually have 120 phones we'll be giving out as well. So um, these cell phone programs have been actually super successful because we know with COVID, everything's gone to online and cell phones. And people need the cell phone and data to be able to connect. You can't connect to income assistance when you get out because you have to make a lot appointment online. Um, you know, a lot of probation officers are still in a lot of way around the community aren't seeing people in person. So you have to phone in. So of course, that's a bigger risk for them to uh, reach as well. So yeah. just want to give those two updates too. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Clarissa, did you have any comments? I'm just reading her her comment in the chat. It says, how soon after this recording um, will be available? Like, will it be sent out right after the meeting? Oh, sorry. Thanks, Clarissa. Um, it probably, again, there's a lot of focus on uh, gathering wisdom this time, but um, it should be done by the end of the week. And then I can send you an email to let you know. Thank you so much. And if anybody is interested in the breakdown and data, I can do it. I'm just not, um, you know, I like talking from the heart when I introduce, but I do have the data. I'm actually quite the over data collector. Um, so um, definitely helps when I write grants to get this on. Um, we're grant funded. Um, First Nations Health Authority does give us um, some funding. Um, but again, we've expanded from you know, five, six staff to 18 and all over the community. Um, I think we're at First Nation Health funds us for 200 clients a year, but we're at 1500. So we're definitely looking to, uh, so I don't keep getting gray hair every year, trying to fight for funding and figure it out because I think we really cover so much. I mean, we do health, crime prevention, homelessness, you know, you know, justice, like there's so many parts what first, you know, UTJ fits and fits under. So we're definitely looking at to some permanent funding um, so that I'm not struggling. Yeah, that's Jesse, 
Yeah. I mean, I could never see us not doing this program when, you know, we have 1500, you know, so many people rely on us. No, no, absolutely. And the, your program is phenomenal. And, and there's so much love and respect for each other, even though it, you know, it's really challenging times. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, Mo, for, for our, our, our health directors, um, is it possible that that people can have you come in and maybe do a webinar for the community and, and talk maybe about what the program is, especially if there's an influx of people transitioning from corrections and maybe how to support, like I know you also have a hub program or is it about mentoring people in the community so they can be like a community champion out of, out of correctional facilities to mentor other people coming back? Yeah, I mean, we definitely did that with Merit. I mean, we know there's no institute in Merit, but um, one of my board members and an elder um, in Merit, like, you know, said, we need it, we need it up here. So I hired a staff up there. Um, he doesn't pick up much from the correctional centers, but he definitely supports people in the community who, you know, he does a lot of going and pick people up, make sure you get to First Nations Court. Um, you know, he volunteers at the shelter to help out. Like we just fill that gap in the community. Um, and he's, you know, he's for, so he was going to join today, but he actually had a First Nations court, so he had to go pick somebody up. Um, so it's really hard to get my staff here because they're all so busy. Um, so yeah, I mean, communities. And yes, talk about a hub. You know, I love these community hubs. You know, UTG started one. We do Mondays in Maple Ridge where we just have pop-up tents, chairs, you know, coffee, you know, something warm to eat. We have, you know, and all the service provides. We have income assistance there. We have UTG, we have wound care, we have outreach workers. And the, you know, this is the most vulnerable population or we're meeting them where they're at outside. You know, they wanna be out there, they come, it's safe. We have support through the community um, as well. So um, I know we've been in talk with Merritt, Nanaimo, uh, White Rock, um, these, they're just amazing. And they really don't, you don't have to have a large budget as long as other community agencies come together. And I think we need to start working together as a community. And we, we make it hard as when you're funded, you know, grant funded, because you have to have so many clients, right? People like don't want to share clients, but, you know, it feels like not every, there's so many complex like, needs for an individual. It's not just about housing. It's not just about mental health. It's not about addiction. It's about all of it. And we need to come together as an org, as a community and best support this population. And I think we can do a lot better job than we are. And I think we're starting to see that shift. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. yeah, so the hub is like, like um, supporting people in like homeless camps, going in there with some primary care basic needs and also supporting yeah. people if they have like warrants or probation, you're like, hey, we're here. How can we help you? Yeah, if they want housing, you know, you have a group to come, you know, everybody comes to get, hey, do you know where to find housing? Like I said, we're just, you know, there are hubs and they be running a month and we've actually now housing seven of the of our, our clients when it came to that hub who were just forgotten because they were at an other end of the city where, you know, they didn't feel safe coming downtown core. So it's actually going and meeting them. You don't have to have them in the same location every time. You can go where, where you know your homeless population is. You can just set up one day a week. It doesn't have to be a seven day. We do it four hours a day, you know, and they come and they know where they can get warm clothes. We had uh, pop-up showers, right? This population doesn't shower, get to, you know, a lot of times they're banned from the shelters because if you're banned from one, usually banned from them all, you know, the only food insecurity, you know, these shelters, the only place they can get food, like, right? So I know in Maple Ridge, we have so many of our population are allowed to into the, uh, the shelter where there's food, right? So who's going to, you know, it's sad that, you know, it's 2023 and we still have so many people in, you know, BC who have food insecurity and don't know where they're going to get their next meal or, you know, they're walking around with flip-flops in winter and no jacket and, can't shower and it just breaks my heart. And um, I just think we can do a better job. And I think this is one way to do it. And it's just coming together and saying, you know, screw, screw, screw the funds, not screw the funders, like screw, let's just work together. You know, we don't have to worry about the stats and the numbers so much about, you know, nowadays it's life and death. You know, it's definitely changed since we started UTG. Um, you know, it still breaks my heart every night I go to bed knowing that eight family members are going to bed without their loved ones, you know, and it doesn't change. It's every night I go to bed, 
you know, and it's it's horrible. Sorry. I get emotional thinking about that. Thank you, Mo. Is there any questions from the audience? Um, yeah, I know we are kind of not a lot of people here today, as it was mentioned, it is a busy time of year, but of course, uh, people will be watching and we do hope to bring you back again. This is my first time hearing about this program and I have to say I, I'm really impressed with what you're doing. Um, I need to commend you and your team for, for finding a way to do this and I need to hold my hands up to you personally, as well as your other peer supports, but to come out and find a way not only to make your life better, but to make life better for other people. I think you really need to be acknowledged for that and, and what you do. So um, yes, very much. It was great meeting you today. I think we're gonna give people a little bit of time back. It sounds like you've got more on your plate than sometimes you know what to do with, but I'm sure people will be reaching out to you, so. Thank you again very much. Yes, yes. If anybody wants to reach out, wants to learn more, just uh, reach out to me. I'm available anytime. So, and thank you definitely for having me. Um, it's great catching up with First Nations Health Authority. We definitely have to update the website with our pro new program. <laughs> Sounds good. I think our elder did have to um, step out by the looks of it. So I will just thank everyone for coming today. I will send you on your way and wishing everyone healthy, happy week. And of course, happy Valentine's Day to everyone. So hopefully you get to spend it with somebody you love. Cheers.